Hi, wherever you are, uh, in Malaysia, in India, or anywhere in the world, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Badan Warisan Malaysia's talk series. I'm Anand Krishnan, an architect, a council member, and moderator for today. Art Deco, as many of you would know, is a modernist and uh, elegant period in world architectural history. It spread to many parts of the world, including Malaysia. Today's talk, however, focuses on India, Mumbai in particular. Our speaker for today is Atul Kumar, an eminent architect and founder and trustee of Art Deco Malaysia. Oh, sorry, Art Deco Mumbai, an organization devoted to saving the Art Deco legacy there. Before we begin, a few reminders. If you have questions, send them to the Q&A box and I'll ask them during the Q&A session at the end. Please state your name and where you're from. The talk will be about 40 minutes or so. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Atul to begin his presentation. Atul, you're there? Yes, thank all you, Anand. It's all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad to be here and I'm going to share my screen to commence my presentation. Uh, is that, just want to quickly confirm that you can see my title slide, Anand. Yes, yes. Okay, lovely. Perfect. Um, so I'm, I'm happy I'm sitting in Bombay. It's four in the afternoon. Uh, we're traversing over to uh, Malaysia and I'm so happy to be speaking to all of you over there. Uh, it's particularly delightful for me to be addressing another tropical country, uh, which is also close to India and I, uh, we're not challenged by time zones as we typically are. I, I remember when we present to Europe or uh, in the United States, it's either very early in the morning or very late at night, which is uh, always makes it a little harder. Um, I'm uh, going to present this uh, in four sections. And uh, I'd like to begin with a little bit of uh, context around Mumbai. Um, followed by the Oval Maidan, which is the fulcrum for the World Heritage Site and Bombay's earliest developments. The Marine Drive, which some of you may be familiar with, is Bombay's most prominent landmark by the sea. Uh, the emergence of an Indian identity within the modern style of Art Deco, how we responded to urban challenges in the UNESCO World Heritage Site inscription, and finally, what did Art Deco Mumbai Trust do to make a difference and I'm going to share that section just so that for those of you who would like to know more about how you can engage with government and with local municipal corporations to make a difference, maybe some of our learnings would be of use to you. Uh, Anand, I'm going to keep a, a tight watch on the clock, so don't worry, we'll try and finish this up in 40 minutes. Um, what you're seeing here is, is, is a map of Mumbai, just so for those who were you are not familiar with India. We're a coastal city located on the west coast and a prominent post on the right, you can see a slightly more zoomed in image of the city. And um, here you'll see uh, a much closer look at the, at the strip of Bombay that is surrounded by water on three sides. And against that, I've juxtaposed Malaysia on your right. Uh, you can see the parallels over here, apart from the fact that both of us are surrounded by water, ours of course being a city and yours being a country, we have a common north-south axis. Um, and you'll notice that this, this north-south axis effectively limits the growth to the north or to the south, and there's no space on, on the east or the western sides for any development. And there is a tremendous influence of the ocean and water that impacts both the cities, particularly in the case of trade, and which impacted the development of both our countries. And lastly, we're also both tropical countries. We share a common climate. And I think in this presentation today, when I use the words like uh, humidity and mosquitoes and, uh, and rainfall, these are not alien to any of you and they're terms that you understand. Uh, as much as uh, we do. Uh, Bombay, the, as the landmass, as you can see here, as one cohesive landmass, wasn't really uh, that when it began its original 
origins in this uh, late 1600s. Uh, here's a map that kind of shows you what Bombay looked like. And we were seven islands, which were gifted by Catherine uh, Braganza, who was a Portuguese princess, in her marriage diary when she married King Charles II uh, in 1661. And <clears throat> King Charles and the British at that time felt that there was really no use for this this agglomeration of islands, which was swampy and marshy and uh, had no activity, very little inhabitation, and of course, no infrastructure. Uh, and they were rented out to the East India Company in 1668 for just 10 pounds a year. Uh, but the gifting of this island to King Charles II effectively began the earliest process of colonization uh, of India. And by 1735, they had realized the, the potential that the city offered because of its safe natural harbor. And the East India Company developed the port in 1735. And that really was the, the magic that transformed Bombay into a very prosperous city. And um, it became a trading center for cotton, which was exported to the West, to the English cotton mills and to uh, export opium to China. Uh, so there was trade happening on both sides of the ocean. In 1861, we had the American Civil War, which effectively uh, shrunk the output of cotton and, you know, increased Bombay's importance because we were exporters of cotton to feed the English mills. The Suez Canal opened in 1869 and just as much as it benefited Malaysia because shipping times became much shorter, effectively Indian goods were now able to reach Europe in just two months as opposed to five months after the, the Suez Canal was commissioned. And then we had the, the gradual reclamation into one large island in the late 19th century and the transition to the first city of India and it has been often commented by historians as also being the first city of the colonial empire because it was essential to the success and prosperity of British trade. In 1995, Bombay was renamed to, to Mumbai. Um, you know, when you look at Art Deco within this country, as you see the dots on your screen, you'll notice that it actually transitions across the entire landscape. Um, we're now looking at Calcutta on the East Coast, and then you have Hyderabad, and then as you come down on the, on the uh, East Coast, you have Chennai, and you have Goa, Kolhapur, Pune, and you'll see the dots across the length and the breadth of the country. And this is just a very small representation of the geographical spread of Deco across the country. Um, so how did this come here, and what brought this style to Bombay? Um, in the 30s, thanks to Bombay being a port and we having a very educated and prosperous middle class, they were expanding tremendously because trade meant that you need laborers in the textile mills, which meant that you had migration of thousands and thousands of people who became the working middle class. And uh, land was reclaimed, Bombay became bigger, Cement became a new construction material that moved away from traditional forms like stone. And uh, this new city burgeoning with people and wealth required a new architecture. And the streamlined modern straight from Paris really fit this bill, which was, you know, perfect for an aspirational society. And the city's first Art Deco district in Churchgate was built on reclaimed land in the, in the early 30s. And uh, my next slide here is really quite a stunning picture, which was taken by the photographer here, Hassler. Um, and I'm, I'm always curious how he took this picture because it's obviously taken from a considerable height and there was nothing that was constructed from where he took it. Um, it's an aerial view of the city in the background. You can see the congested uh, you know, area of the city. Uh, the yellow line that you can see really will demarcate the entire area that was reclaimed from the sea. So the entire southern portion of this image is actually the first reclaimed land that took place. In front of it is the Oval Maidan. And in the backdrop of this image, 
on your right hand side, you can see <clears throat> the port, uh, which is the safe harbor where uh, all the ships came and unloaded their cargoes. And this picture really beautifully captures the extent of congestion in the old city as we know it. Uh, interestingly, Art Deco is not just spread across the entire country, but it's also across the length and breadth of Art Deco neighborhoods. Um, the city starting from the southernmost tip where you can see Colaba and then it just literally spreads, you know, across neighborhoods, across going north and east and west, um, finally ending in Chambur and Juhu, which are the, the suburbs of the city. Uh, now, of course, almost intrinsically part of core of the city. This spread uh, has a unique emotional connect with Mumbaikers. And this is interesting simply because People live in these buildings. This is modern heritage that is occupied by people. It's a part of their urban and social fabric. And I like to define it as an emotional quotient which builds a bond between the built form and the people who live there. And I'll just quickly run you through this because it's quite a unique uh, interface between people and the built form. Um, you look at this and you see healthcare and properties, i.e. hospitals, apartment homes, educational institutions, and such like. Typically, you could be born in an Art Deco hospital. Uh, so, so you literally come to life. That's where your parents went and you were born there. And you have memories associated with your birth in an Art Deco property. And then you go home and given the, the spread of, of Art Deco across the city, and the incredible density that it has, it is a very, very high likelihood that you live in an apartment home that is an art deco property. And then you went to school. Uh, so many of Bombay's prominent schools like Don Bosco or the government law college are all art deco properties. Um, so your education was probably in an art deco property. And then you, you graduated and you went to look for your first job. And as I'll show you later in my presentation, you probably went and worked in an art deco building uh, and built your career. And people were not that mobile 30 years ago, 20 years ago. So largely you kind of worked where you grew up and where you studied. Uh, the entertainment spaces in the city, particularly the cinema theaters were all picture palaces where you went for entertainment and movies were at that time the place for you to go and spend time. Unlike today where you, were, you, know, you have streaming content and you have other digital options. And you had, uh, in the evening, you had places also for social interaction. So clubs, which are very popular in Bombay, are also places of social interaction and are some of the most magnificent Art Deco properties. And the top of mind that comes to me is the Cricket Club of India which is one of the finest cricketing grounds in the country and extremely popular. popular. So, so you can see the kind of deco typologies that can literally surround your life and in, in some sense actually consume it. And it's across generations. Uh, currently, the fourth generation of family members are now living in these properties and enjoying this kind of experience in these modern homes. Uh, the Oval Maidan is a property which effectively, Oval oh, Maidan is another word for park. Uh, it's a 22 acre park in the heart of the city and is really the fulcrum around which the first development began. And I had shown you in my earlier slide how, slide how water had been pushed back and uh, land had been filled and reclamation had been completed. Uh, at the Oval Maidan, this is what came up. Um, these were the first set of modern apartments. And the beauty is their symmetry, which did not happen by chance. The, the municipal corporation actually mandated there must be ground plus five floors. Every building must be cuboid in structure. It must have a flat roof. There must be adequate setback on all sides. And it really took 
uh, the architects some incredible ingenuity to differentiate each building from the other. And I'll, I'll share a few slides which will show you the magic of this neighborhood, which was the first development in 1935. Uh, this is a, a architectural lettering in one of the buildings along that precinct. It's called Sunshine. Uh, this lettering is now 90 years old and it looks like it was made yesterday, still in pristine condition and it's withstood rain, humidity, uh, extreme heat, uh, and all the vagaries of being exposed to the weather. Uh, again, set against uh, a lovely uh, terrazzo sun in the as a backdrop. And these uh, letterings were made of metal, concrete, or wood, and actually added to the identity and the ornamentation of the building. Uh, the next building is uh, another marvelous piece of work that's extremely well maintained. It's called the Shiv Shanti Bhavan. It's a it's a street corner building, which means that the facade actually flank, is flanked by two major streets on either side. So you have one on this side, you have a major road, and then you have a major road on this side. Um, <clears throat> and you can see how well and how sensitively the residents have maintained the color palette and with no interventions on the facade. Next to it stands a, a building called Rajab Mahal along the Oval Maidan, uh, designed by Merwanji Bana and company. Interestingly, the same architect as uh, for the previous building. Um, you can see here, you know, we call her the jazz queen of Bombay and you can see the rising sun over here, or you can look at them as, as pyramids with Egyptian influence. Uh, when we took some school children on a walk, one of them is a remark. He said, you know, this is origami. This is what I do with paper. Uh, I think that's the magic of Art Deco and the many, many ways it's open to interpretation. Um, the red arrow really highlights a diagonal line, and this is um, called a mullion. And, you know, it really serves no purpose because it's purely ornamental. Uh, it doesn't hold the glass in place. It doesn't support the wooden frame. But it's a fine example of how design element was, was introduced by the architect in order to enhance the visual appeal of the property. Um, I'll just share one more building in this precinct called Court View. Um, and on the on the central facade, you can see on the left in dark blue, probably one of the, the finest specimens of the frozen fountain, which is another symbol of eternal youth, uh, which adorns the facade of this building. And it has unique balconies, um, and these, we call them the wave balconies because of the way they're formed, representing uh, Bombay's location by the ocean and uh, bringing an element of the sea over here. So it's a wave form balcony. And the relief work in the middle shows, you know, crashing waves. Uh, we have many tropical features represented in Bombay's Art Deco. Uh, ocean waves, which I just talked about. There are sunbursts, there's the moon, there's tropical flora and fauna. And of course, there's visual representation through bas relief, metal grills, porches, railings, and the extent of detailing is quite remarkable. And there is so much of it that it's so easy to miss a lot of it. Uh, Bombay's architecture is also climate responsive. Uh, there was a time when architecture was practiced that was not in confrontation with the environment. It responded to the environment. You didn't have glass and steel towers that basically isolated you within an air-conditioned environment. Here you had eyebrows or chajjas, as they're called. Uh, these are cantilevered ledges that protect many windows. And it would both, you know, block out the sun, it would provide shade to the interiors. And it was a incredibly a rhythmic horizontality that accentuated design. Um, and the balcony, of course, is a cantilever projection and it would give you shade from the strong sun and, you know, you could sit in the rains and, and not get wet and enjoy the view. Uh, so, Today's architecture sadly seems to confront the same elements and we have moved away from being responsive. 
this is a fine example. I just showed you this building earlier and you can see these eyebrows. You can see the yellow highlight over here on my screen. So this is what is called an eyebrow rich hajja and we call uh, Shiv Shanti Bhavan the eyebrow queen of Mumbai because of the beautiful 15 eyebrows that it has. Um, this is another magnificent property uh, belonging to a textile magnet, Mafatlal's. It's a, it's a beautiful bungalow, um, four stories high, built by Master Sate and Bhuta, who were <clears throat> one of the most prolific art deco architects of their time. And here you can see, uh, as you move your eye along the yellow line, you will appreciate what is called a continuous eyebrow that runs across the entire property. And you'll notice how it not only it gives you a streamlined effect, and yet it presents uh, a protective element uh, to manage the hostile tropical weather. Um, in this building, or also in the Church Gate Back Bay Reclamation Area, you can see two-tone banding to highlight the different colors. And on the building on the left, you can see another eyebrow, which gives a protection to the balcony below it. And you can see a wooden railing on top of this, uh, resembling something like a ship deck or, or a viewing gallery, which leads me to Marine Drive, which I think is probably one of Bombay's most iconic bays. It has a, a four kilometer long promenade by the sea. And for the longest time, Bombay has been recognized by images from Marine Drive. Uh, on your left, you can see the sweep of the bay and there are 35 consecutive Art Deco buildings, each of them either five or seven stories high, following a very similar pattern to the Oval Precinct with cuboid structures, similar height, similar massing, and uh, with the soft yellow lighting around the whole bay, it's uh, uh, it acquired the name of being the Queen's Necklace. Um, on the left, you can see a lot of cars and you know, in the early 30s, we had uh, Ford, General Motors, um, Chevrolet, all being built in Bombay. And uh, the reason for this kind of busy street scene over here where you see cars parked three to a row is because the Cricket Club of India was here and we only later figured out that there was a cricket match on that day. And that's why um, this, this, uh, traffic jam, so to speak. Um, this agglomeration of buildings, 35 of them, led UNESCO to comment when they inscribed this precinct as a World Heritage Site, that the Art Deco buildings are one of the largest and most homogenous assemblages of Art Deco buildings in Asia and the world, which makes it a unique honor. Um, one of the pride and joy of Marine Drive is this property called the Suna Mahal. It, if you notice, it's also the building in our logo, uh, very similar. We call her the, the gold standard on Marine Drive. It's again a street corner face of building. And at the top here, you know, you can see a turret. And this really was, was a viewing gallery. So it was a social space in, in the 30s people, and by that I mean the residents, would come back from a day of work and in the evening you would go upstairs, you would meet in the viewing gallery, you would watch the sunset, you would talk to your neighbors. And the architecture, as you can see, supported social engagement. So the terrace was a place for social interaction um, and building a sense of community between all the residents who live here. This also is a, is a fine example of streamlining. Uh, you can see the curvilinear form as the building curves across from one street to the, to the other, including the balconies. Uh, this building has an interesting history. It was, it was built by a gentleman called Kawasji Sidwa. Uh, believe it or not, he was Bombay's most successful bootlegger. And he maintains to for a long time that, that his, his bootlegged whiskey was a lot better than what was being imported into the country at that time. Uh, here's another prominent building, again, street corner facing, and you can see the focus along the, the central middle portion with its fluted columns and the locomotive balconies on either side, owned by the Sixeria family, who was 
you know, cotton king of the world and, and India's first member of the New York uh, Cotton Exchange. Such was his wealth that this is just a, a quick glimpse at his lobby. And you can see it's uh, paneled in marble, Italian marble, from the floor to the ceiling, which is very unusual because typically it's only the first three feet that is clad in any kind of tiling or marble. But here is marble on the floor. It's marble on the side walls and the dadoing <clears throat> is all the way up to the ceiling, which increases the cost very hugely. But he wanted the best for his family. And then you have a magnificent teak door in the middle through which you enter the building. <clears throat> Marine Drive's design also uh, reflects a lot of nautical features. So the sea obviously and the ocean had to have an impact on the architecture. And, and likewise, the architecture reflected many of the designs and influences that impacted, that identified Bombay as a port city. And uh, you had ocean liners which were coming in from all over the world and they were literally floating deco palaces. And uh, these were incorporated as design elements within the design of buildings. Uh, that dot along Marine Drive. And let me quickly show you a lovely property called Sonawala Building, uh, which means the jewelers building, uh, since the family that built it were a family of jewelers. And here you can see porthole windows like you would see on an ocean liner. Um, and these are ventilators which allow in light or breeze. And typically these were in the toilet block so you can see how even the toilets were sea facing so you could catch the breeze and uh, allow ventilation within within the toilets and notice a very subtle but but important uh, object in your pictures look at these palm trees so it's not just architecture that was climate responsive even the choice of flora and fauna was very carefully thought through and these can withstand you know hurricanes uh, level winds and have been there for about 80 years now. Uh, this is a close up uh, here. You can see the porthole window. And on the balcony, you see, you see a wooden uh, ship deck style railing. Um, again, you know, reflecting Bombay's identity with the sea. Uh, so the first block that came up around the oval was, you know, all buildings were named representing colonial aspirations. So you had Empress Court and Windsor House and St. James Court. And then when you came into the next stage of reclamation and the next development, you saw a whole Indian identity being expressed in the naming convention of buildings, which were reflective of the Indian families who owned them. And you'll see this gradual transition as I take you through my presentation. Um, we can't talk about Bombay without talking about its magnificent cinema theaters. Uh, the Regal Cinema is, is had, was the first cinema with air conditioning, neon lighting, underground parking, uh, special seats for hearing impaired. These were all very, very ahead of their time in the 30s. Uh, the interiors used a lot of teak and marble. Eros Theater at Churchgate are synonymous. You can't talk about Churchgate without talking about Eros Theatre, um, a magnificent picture palace on three junction of three roads and, and a masterpiece of, you know, ziggurat or stepped style of architecture, uh, a bit like a tiered cake. And of course, the, the Liberty Cinema, which is a tribute to the Frozen Fountain. It is remarkable. This is Canadian cedar that you can see which has now been there for 70 years and it still looks like it was imported yesterday and laid out over there. Um, Bombay's architecture also reflects a strong modern, Swadeshi modern identity. So uh, you can see a stronger cultural expression being reflected in the architecture. And I'm gonna show you quickly a few pictures so you appreciate just how amazing uh, or rather how beautifully architects at that time melded both the, the Indian expression of their identity along with a modern style from the West, uh, a unique amalgamation. 
So this is the new India Assurance Building. It's a insurance company and uh, you can see the larger than life bass relief works and you can see, you know, an agrarian worker in an Indian uh, attire. He's wearing a dhoti. You have a woman on the right hand side who's working on a loom wearing a sari. And uh, on, in this building at Fort, you can see the statue of Lakshmi at the top. On the right hand side, you can see uh, elephants in a forest, each one in a very active position uh, that symbolizes strength and solidity. Um, this is the cotton exchange building and again you can see bass relief on the facade which symbolizes various uh, traditional Indian activities here. They're loading and unloading cotton bales uh, for export. Um, and then you also have a strong Indian identity, you had cultural, multicultural representation of all faiths. Uh, and I like to think that that was representative of Bombay's unique cosmopolitanism. Um, and the next few slides, you'll quickly get a sense of that. Here you can see the Devanagari font now making itself seen for the first time. And you can see the symbol Om, which is a sacred sound and a, and a spiritual symbol in Indian religion. Uh, in a Parsi Agyari, you can see a Parsi place of worship, a fire temple. You can see the Lamaksu on the left, on the left and you can see lettering in Gujarati uh, over here. Um, and then uh, in Madina Manzil, you can see it's replete with deco features, but also a very rich uh, and sophisticated Islamic iconography with a crescent moon and a star, and it's uh, stepped. Uh, crown uh, being the, the main showpiece of the building. Here's another building with an Om sign. And all these developments really were created by master Indian architects who went to London, studied at the Royal College of Art, went across to Paris, uh, saw the industrial, <clears throat> the modern industrial exhibition of decoratives in Paris in 1925, came back and brought this style uh, to India. Um, we have to respond to urban challenges. And I'll now transition to another aspect where I'd like to focus on how we responded to the challenges of expensive real estate, the pressures of urban development, how our cities are magnets for livelihood and, and there's an extensive migration of people into these areas. And then you have this modern living heritage, which you're trying to balance and preserve despite all these pressures. And I think here in, uh, in Mumbai, as in Kuala Lumpur, you have a similar story. You have high population density. They're both financial hubs, very expensive to live in, but with some precious heritage. Um, Bombay was inscribed in 2018 as a World Heritage Site. Uh, sorry, not Bombay, but the Victorian Gothic and Art Deco ensembles. You Here you can see the Oval Maidan and this entire 66 hectare ensemble with 94 buildings in it is now a World Heritage Site. And the primary criteria for accepting this was criteria two and four for those of you who are familiar with ICOMOS and with the criteria for inscription. Uh, you would find these two criteria interesting and you would know what it's about. Um, the property is not just about deco. Um, we have an Indo-Saracenic building, so a magnificent Prince of Wales Museum. We have uh, a neoclassical properties over here. We have some fine Victorian Gothic uh, buildings. This is the Bombay University Convocation Hall, the library, and of course the um, uh, the Rajabai clock tower on your right. And uh, you have the Bombay High Court, which is another magnificent Victorian Gothic building. Uh, this map very quickly shows you the entire precinct, uh, which comprises of the inscription. This bit, <clears throat> sorry, in the on the lower half in orange are all the Art Deco buildings. And you can see what a collection it is. Here's your Oval Maidan. And then here's where you have your Art Deco, neoclassical, Saracenic properties. And it led UNESCO to remark that, you know, uh, 
these two centuries, both the 19th and the 20th, confront each other in a theatrical architectural display at the Oval Maidan, which is why I called it the fulcrum. Uh, I think I have another three, four minutes, so let me quickly talk to you about how we made this happen and what we're doing at Art Deco Mumbai. And there could be probably some learnings for heritage enthusiasts in, in your country who might benefit from this. We, we basically do a lot of documentation, research, outreach, and advocacy. Um, photo documenting neighborhoods really has created one of the richest inventories of Art Deco buildings dedicated to the city, which is available in the public domain on our website. Um, this is how we would pick a neighborhood, uh, isolate a neighborhood, um, walk around it, identify how many buildings there are, 273 buildings. Our, our, our teams have walked through all these neighborhoods and photo documented. There are 89 properties and then each building gets a panel made like this where you get to see six, nine photographs which highlight essential Art Deco elements. And there's of course a map and the GPS coordinates and, and there's an architectural description of the property. And we like to think that this will help uh, preserve and encourage people to appreciate what they have and therefore participate actively in its restoration and preservation. Our ongoing documentation has now, we've documented 2,130 buildings across the length and breadth of the city over the last four or five years. And we have documented 836 buildings just in Mumbai city proper. It's truly a staggering number. Um, it's very precious because it's only 90 years old. So everybody takes it for granted and says, so why is this important? Because it's so much part of our lives that it's almost become ordinary. And I'd like to end with, you know, a very interesting saying by architect late Kamu Ayer, who said that some things are worth keeping even if they do not have a patina acquired with age. We, we have so much respect and we have so many financial resources available for the legacy of the Victorian Gothic architecture that we inherited from a colonial empire that I think it's important to reflect on what Kamu said that there are things which are worth keeping even though they may not be that old. Uh, thank you so much uh, Anand. I hope I've managed to keep within your timeline. Uh, these are our, our, our contact coordinates. You can email us, you can visit our website. And of course, we're on all the social media handles uh, under the tagline Art Deco Mumbai. Uh, thank you so much. I do hope you enjoyed this and I look forward to talking to all of you now. Excellent, that was wonderful. Um, Art Deco is such a, a beautiful uh, period in, in, in history and its buildings are also uh, um, early modern. It, it led to the formation and thinking of uh, modernists and modernism that, that came after it. So um, I think, you know, the buildings that are in um, Mumbai, in places like uh, um, Miami and Napier in, in New Zealand, some in Malaysia and throughout the world, um, they have this common legacy and, and I think that that's wonderful and, and it's great that um, we, we've seen um, what it's like in Mumbai. So um, it's not question and answers, um, uh, so if anyone has any questions uh, to Atul, uh, please um, uh, put it in the Q&A uh, &A box and, and I'll ask. But let me start by, by asking, um, uh, or perhaps just um, saying some things about it um, and, and maybe with a question after that. Um, with so many buildings in, in Mumbai, um, and you've, you've uh, done 836, you've documented over 800 buildings and all. I'm, I'm curious about um, how, how does, the laws support um, maintaining these buildings. Uh, is, is, is pressure placed on owners to, to maintain it? Do they get subsidies? 
Um, are they allowed to do renovations and and um, and things like that? So what what's what's your comments or what's your views about this? Or can you tell me tell us the uh, Mumbai experience? That's a very good question, Anand. And I think, uh, as I mentioned to you, there is a lot of pressure. There is a constant pressure of redevelopment. Having said that, in 1990, we were the first city in India to adopt the heritage rules for the city, which actually graded each building on a scale of grade one, grade two, grade three, where of course grade one was sacred as being of very significant importance and would have very rigorous rules protecting it. And then you had grade two and grade three. But I think more than 95% of Bombay's Art Deco modern architecture has no protection. And I think the larger initiative that we set out to do was just to allow people to appreciate and understand its significance and its relevance in their lives. And if you remember that slide from the emotional quotient, I talked about how it has been a part of everybody's life in so many multitudinal ways that the response of people has been quite amazing. Having said that, I think we're seeing a greater and greater loss to redevelopment. And partly, you know, Asian cultures encourage families to live together. So family sizes have increased and there are legitimate needs for larger homes and more housing. And we also have a huge migrant population. So that's, that's a, a genuine concern which is being addressed. At the same time, we have a very active heritage conservation committee, which is run by the local municipal corporation. And they have been very supportive in in making sure that people are doing redevelopment or improvements in a very restrained manner or in a manner that maintains the overall homogeneity of a particular precinct. So who, who sort of uh, um, acts as the custodian or the guardian of, of these buildings? Is it the local authorities or is there a, um, a body that, that does that, a heritage body? or? So we have uh, a lot of stakeholder activism. Uh, people living in these neighborhoods are very strongly identified with these properties. So any change that is made results in an extensive public debate. And uh, in some cases, even the media is very engaged with it. And so government and policymakers are always a little careful about how best to respond to their, you know, fancy plans for essentially going vertical. Yeah. But to answer your specific question, yes, there is a Mumbai Heritage Conservation Committee. Oh, I and see. It is it's protected by law. It's protected by law. Every proposal has to go to the committee. It has bureaucrats. It has architects, conservationists, and historians. They discuss each proposal, and only after their approval can can uh, changes be made. And does Art Deco Mumbai uh, um, help in um, in formulating these policies or these guidelines and and, uh, and laws? Yes, we do engage very actively with government. So we have made suggestions that you know there can be some kind of a financial incentive for people to repair their buildings. After all, they are 80-year-old properties and they do need some kind of support. So, uh, yes, it's a process of continued engagement with government. Excellent. Uh, we've got a few questions from uh, the, the those present. Uh, Nisha, whom I'm sure you've met. Uh, yes, of course. Hi, Nisha. About, yeah. Um, are these uh, buildings, um, they're low-rise? Why, why is that? Are there any high-rise buildings? Oh, trust me, uh, there are lots of high-rise buildings and they're going up as high as 70, 80, 90 stories high. So the city is transitioning from being a low-rise ground well, to uh, four-story properties. Sorry, to, uh, the Art Deco buildings. Are there any high-rise Art Deco buildings? No, all the new buildings are all modern, you know, 21st century construction which are all 50, 60 stories high. So the, all the original buildings are, are about five or six stories high. So uh, is that because of uh, maybe the, the evolution of the lift or, or 
how 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 would you account for this for that so it was it was actually urban planning that dictated it they the 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 land development was only permitted if you built a building that was five stories high yeah that was cuboid in structure that had lots of space on either side for cross ventilation you know the setback on uh, you be familiar with the concept I see. and of course there had to be parks and open spaces so that was the legacy of bombay which of uh, course is changing it, rapidly could it have been because it's on reclaimed land and and or something along those lines for structural no 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 on the same reclaimed land they're now building 90 story towers so it's <laughs> All right. The next question is from Alex uh, Widem. I, I hope I've pronounced your name right. Uh, he just wants to know if there are any books on uh, Art Deco, uh, any particular ones that you would recommend. Yes, uh, Alex. If you go to our website and at the top there's a search bar and just type books or library, it'll take you to a page which lists all the books on Art Deco, uh, both related to Bombay and also international Art Deco. and you might find that very useful excellent um there's another one from uh, someone who who who's uh, signed in anonymously so i'll just read it out um were the buildings owned were the art deco buildings owned by one family or or did they have separate tenants which would go under a different kind of strata title or something that's a very good question part of the emotional portion that i talked about is the fact that all these buildings are family owned so they were built by families who prospered through trade in the 1930s and those same families still own those buildings so the sense of ownership and identity is very strong but yes a lot of them also have tenants so it's a mixed use but the ownership control still resides with one family so today it's the fourth generation living in these apartments excellent excellent so uh, um i've just made i i feel like i like to make a comment about what's happening in malaysia because we've got a talk that's coming up next week and yes. um um i remember when i was a small boy my father taking me to the odeon cinema in, in kuala lumpur and and that's a, a beautiful art deco building and uh, which is currently not demolished but it's um it's being used as a as a mall or a shop or something and it, and its features are all taken away and and um i think we have a lot to learn from from mumbai um and and um, it'll be a good idea if if uh, um you would come here more often and perhaps <laughs> advise uh, people over here uh, um and 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 do help us uh, preserve some of these buildings you know so um um is there anything else would you would like to uh, add uh, atul before we we wrap it up no i just like to extend a very warm welcome to to your friends of the society your members if you come to mumbai and you'd like to do a heritage walk or a tour we'd be very happy Uh, to host you and take you around and uh, for those of you who are heritage conservationists or enthusiasts we come and visit us at our office and we'd always be happy to engage and have conversations with you so i uh, just like to say thank you to everybody for that thank you so much atul that is a wonderful talk and and it was very succinct and and very clear and concise and i i applaud your presentation you know it's, it's thank you so topic. much yeah thank you for having me Okay before uh, uh, before we go um just a few few things I'd like to uh, mention first of all I'd like to thank um everyone who attended um for everyone's interest and participation in in today's talk and also uh, I'd like to um uh, appreciate and and thank uh, a few people in Baden Warisan this Vanessa our general manager Nisha who who actually organized this whole series of yes. talks Yeah. Um Amira and Rosniza from Baden Weissen Malaysia. Um I like to thank Atul and Sohasini from uh, uh, Art Deco uh, Mumbai for for um for the talk and and that's wonderful. Um I hope that all of us uh, all of you rather would uh, join us next Thursday on the 4th of August at 6:30 p.m. 
for the second part of our Art Deco series uh, talks. Uh, it's titled Of Eyebrows and Flagpoles, Art Deco in Malaysia by architect Yvonne Leong and Simon Sun. Um, here's a plug, please follow Badan Warisan Malaysia on our website. You can subscribe to our e-newsletter called Jendela Warisan uh, or follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more information on upcoming events and news on heritage in Malaysia. Now, um, Baden Warisan is an independent non-government organization and um, we do not receive any financial support from the government, which is a pity. <laughs> so if you have enjoyed today's talk and wish to support our educational and advocacy work, please donate to Baden uh, or make uh, uh, or participate in some way or other, become a member. Details are available on our on the screen that's coming up, or it's already on the screen now, um, or, our, or on our website. Thank you so much in advance for your kind support, and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone again uh, next Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Um, I wish you a lovely evening. Thank you very much, Atul, and everyone in Mumbai who attended. Um, Thank you so much. Thank right. you again. Bye-bye. We'll just, Bye -bye. we'll just play a video about Baran Warisan before you before sure. go. Right. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So uh, have a good evening.